Hi guys, welcome to History Infection, and this time I'm talking about typhoid infection and a not-so-little lady from Ireland called Mary. Typhoid got its name to distinguish itself from typhus, uh, however they're quite different diseases. They're both caused by bacteria, but typhoid is spread by a salmonella bacteria called Salmonella typhi, whereas typhus is spread by a completely different species of bacteria. It's also spread by tick bites from getting faecal tick material into wounds. The French biologist Pierre Louise coined the term typhus-like or typhoid in 1829 to distinguish between these two different kinds of infection. During this time of history, typhoid had quite a few roles to play in history. For one, it nearly put Parliament out of business. Parliament was so overwhelmed by the stench coming from the local river that they threatened to move away from the palace at Parliament. During this time, London was drowning in filth and squalor. The taste and smell from open sewage systems could be smelt throughout the whole of the city of London. And of course, with open sewage came pathogens that rely on fecal to oral transfer, which is as pleasant as it sounds. This was also the era of our old friend miasma theory of diseases. This suggests that bad odours and bad smells are what causes diseases to spread, which if you were living in London at this time and believed in this theory and there was such a horrid stench from the open sewages that you'd be terrified and believing that this smell was going to make you ill. And everywhere you look, you would see these sorts of diseases like typhoid and cholera. In 1858 came what was known as the Great Stink. London got quite hot during one summer and this helped to petrify and putrefy the open sewage and fecus matter going throughout the Thames and the whole of London gagged for almost a year. This led Parliament to actually try and close and move to a different location to get away from the bad smell. The proximity of the Parliament probably had quite a lot to play with the fact that the modernisation of London's sewer system actually happened. Work on the sewer system had been rejected only a few years earlier because apparently the country didn't have enough money to modernise the sewer system. However, the Great Stink helped to galvanise this response and actually led to the modernisation of London's sewage system. One thing that might have played quite a big role in the outbreak of the Great Stink was the fact that people had started investing their money in things like flushing toilets. This meant the total volume, let's say, of fecal material going to the sewage system had greatly increased, which means that the sewage could no longer handle that volume, and they would just come out from the ground. One famous victim of the Great Stink is the Prince in the Can, good old Prince Albert. The grounds around Windsor Castle had a problem every time that the Thames rose up in volume, they would be sodden with the sewage system that was underneath the castle. Three years later, after the Great Stink, Albert died of what we suspect might have been typhoid fever, although he could have had other diseases like Crohn's disease. Today, typhoid fever is believed to infect over 17 million people worldwide, and 600,000 of these will die. However, if you do get treatment, your survival rate goes up to 99%. The bacteria has a number of virulence factors which show that it's a obligate human pathogen. This means it doesn't really have any other natural environment to go into. It is a true and true human pathogen. Without humans, Salmonella typhi probably wouldn't exist, or wouldn't exist in its current form. The bacteria produces what's known as an endotoxin. This is a toxin that's kept within the bacterial cell wall, and only really becomes released once the bacteria is destroyed. Other virulence factors include the VI antigen, which stands for virulence antigen. This antigen seems to reduce the activation of the complement system. Your complement system is part of the immune system's way of literally punching holes in foreign tissues that shouldn't be there. It's also part of the innate immune system, which means it doesn't require activation for memory cells to turn on. It will just attack anything that it suspects shouldn't be there. However, to avoid the immune system completely, Salmonella typhi has a quite clever trick. It produces a molecule called invasin, which means it allows other cells, human cells, to phagocytote around the bacteria and engulf it. Now, these cells typically are not phagocytotic cells, meaning they don't normally do this. The bacteria tricks them into doing it and lives inside the host cell away from the majority of your immune system. Even when a person has recovered or is recovering from typhoid fever, they can still transmit the pathogen through their feces. This is a process known as shedding. This brings us to a heavyset Irish cook who didn't think she had to wash her hands in between cooking and going to the loo. In 1884, a woman named Mary Mallon arrives from Ireland to America. Six years later, and she's found work as a cook in the New York area. Whoever and wherever she seems to work, typhoid seems to follow this woman around. At least six families came down with typhoid fever infections during her time as their cook. In 1906, George Sotner 
is hired by one of these families to try and track down where the infection came from, as they believe it might have been their cook. He manages to track a list of infections that happen around the New York area in quite well-to-do areas where typically typhoid isn't seen. All the infections he's tracked down seem to have one unique connecting factor, a heavy-set, tall Irish woman who seems to be in perfect health. Sopner manages to track down this woman due to an outbreak at a penthouse where two servants became very sick and the daughter of the family actually died. Sopner approached Mary and tried to be diplomatic and asked her for a sample of her feces and urine. However, he did also tell her that he believed that she was responsible for all the outbreaks of typhoid happening in the area and that he would, in fact, like to remove her gallbladder to check for the bacteria. Mary was not best pleased with the suggestion and she chased him away with some sort of cooking implement. It's sometimes reported to be a carving fork, sometimes to be a carving knife or a butcher's knife. In 1907, the New York Health Department sent Dr. Sarah Baker to talk to Mary and try and get her to come in and actually submit to the test. However, Mary believed that she hadn't done anything wrong and that the law enforcement agencies were just trying to persecute her for no other reason than possibly racism for her Irish heritage or some other looking for a scapegoat. Baker returned a few days later with five police officers and they took Mary into custody. Mary was then held in quarantine on North Brother Island for three years. During her admittance, she admitted that she didn't really take much care of hygiene, let's say. She didn't wash her hands after using the loo and cooking food for the families. Feces and urine samples were collected by force and they were found to contain the bacteria, suggesting that her gallbladder, as Sopner has suggested, was full of infected Salmonella typhi bacteria. In 1809, the Journal of American Medical Association published an article which they called Mary Malone Typhoid Mary, and this is where the term being a typhoid Mary came from. After three years due to in part public outcry, Mary was released only under the express condition that she never took up cooking again, and that she had her gallbladder removed. That would have been the end of Mary's story, but she decided not to do any of it that they asked her to do. She changed her name from Mary Malone to Mary Brown as to allow the city to lose track of her, and she kept her gallbladder and carried on cooking. During the next five years when she was cooking, again, typhoid seemed to follow this woman around, and George Sopner tried to track her down, but because she changed her name, he couldn't seem to get ahead of her, and she would always be one step ahead of him. In 1915, an outbreak of typhoid at a woman's hospital led the local community and uh, police force to suspect that Mary might have returned to the scene of the crime. A heavy-set, 40-year-old something Irish woman disappeared from the kitchens soon after the infection of typhoid happened. She was later tracked down to an estate of Long Island. This led Mary to be quarantined for a second time for the remainder of her life at Northern Brother Island. She died in 1938 of a ammonia infection, and during the autopsy, when they removed her gallbladder, they did in fact find that it was full of salmonella typhi. In her time as a cook, she definitely killed at least three people, but we don't really know the full amount of people that died because of her poor hygiene. She completely point blank refused to accept that she was responsible for any of these deaths or any of the people getting typhoid. She said, essentially, I'm fine, it has nothing to do with me. She also refused to cooperate with any of the investigations, so we'll never know just how many people she cooked for and how many of them got typhoid and how many of them died because of her interactions with their food, shall we say. So that brings us to an end of this history of infection. Uh, I hope you've enjoyed it. If you have, feel free to like and subscribe, all that great stuff. Um, I hope you'll join me next time when I'll be talking about a short history of cancer and a woman who now weighs around 40 tons. Hope you join me then. See you next time. Thanks for watching.